author, and teacher of spirit, um, scripture. In January 2016, God bless Virginia with an international um, satellite show, um, radio broadcast, where she was heard in places like Hong Kong, Germany, and Canada. Unfortunately, this broadcast only lasted about four and a half months when she was diagnosed with stage three colon cancer in May of 2016. Often, she smiles and says, God has a sense of humor. She was teaching a group of, about coming out of their shell of introversion, writing another book on this topic, and had a radio um, broadcast as well as speaking on YouTube uploads, then found herself in the hospital for 11 days. Upon coming home, she states that she found herself either in bed or on the couch unable to continue with the task at hand, when she prayed, Lord, you heal me of my introversion, yet I find myself feeling completely isolated. So today, Regina is going to share her journey through the valley of the shadow of death. Regina. family did. I'm in Rogers Town too. <laughs> um, so it was interesting that at least seven of us within a mile of one another had some form of cancer or another. Um, and I'd like to say, and I didn't have this in my notes, but I'm very thankful for Rogers Town, for that community, for the way that they pull together and they lift you up. They are the hands and feet of Jesus. They understand what service is, what bringing Jesus outside of four walls and somebody that is in need is, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. I begin tonight with Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, which says, and they overcame him, they overcame the adversary because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. I'm here today to help those fellas. You have a nice way to go, go through their journey. It's the adversary reaches out to tear you down. That's his job. But our testimony is our warfare. It is warfare. When you share, as you did tonight, you lift others up. You give them hope. Sometimes the battles that we go through aren't for us at all, but they're an opportunity for those that are in our community or surrounding areas to be a blessing. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says, He who began, again, who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. As she said, in January 2016, I was a blessed woman. I had published a book. I was teaching on YouTube and in other groups. I had the weekly satellite radio that God absolutely gave me. I didn't give it to me. When there was no broadcast charge or anything. And I was getting praises, as she said, from Germany and Canada and Hong Kong, places that never hear about Jesus. And I was sitting in Ward, South Carolina. If you blink, you missed it. Um, then I got allowed it. But May 5th, I got really sick, and I started having some severe abdominal pain. And I wouldn't tell anybody, because May 6th, my daughter, who was in cosmetology school, had a fashion show to help raise money for domestic violence awareness. And I was one of her models. And it was her night to shine, so I couldn't be sitting in the ER. I was so bloated. I didn't know if I would fit into the dress that I was supposed to wear. So I rushed out that afternoon and bought a corset and squeezed it all in, pain and all, and said a prayer. Lord, don't let me pass out from pain as I walked in this room. Because I'm stubborn and I'm not telling anybody I'm in pain. We made it through the night and it was a wonderful, wonderful event. 
Now when my daughter found out the kind of pain I was in, she was not very happy with me. And as Phyllis said, sometimes we exchange words, you know. Um, but I, I told her it'd be okay. Um, May 7th, I went for my first trip to the ER. They did a CAT scan and told me I had a mass on my colon. I would expect them to admit me at this time to find out what was going on, but they didn't. Um, they sent me home with pain pills and told me about laxative that it was more than likely just constipation. But to call their associate the following Monday to schedule a colonoscopy. So I suffered through the weekend. That Monday morning I called the, the, the guy's office for the colonoscopy. First thing, his very polite receptionist said, we can get you in for that on May 23rd. And I said, I'll be dead if I wait till May 23rd. So I went back to the ER, begging them to help me. Told them, you know, I'm trying hard to be a compliant patient. Just help me. Um, they run a few more tests and once again sent me home with pain pills. So I was leaving into my own understanding, and you know, scripture tells us not to do that. My reason for going to this hospital was because it was local to my daughter's cosmetology school, and in my mind, it's more convenient for everybody if I have to be admitted if we're all in the same area. Um, however, by Thursday night, I couldn't take the pain anymore. Um, my husband had been up since 4 a.m. working, so I didn't want him to have to go sit hours at another emergency room. So I called my mother and asked her to take me in. When she came to pick me up, my husband said, I don't care where you take her, but it's not going back to that same hospital. And when you get her there, tell them she's not coming home until somebody knows what's going on. God works in the midst of our storms. We, we went to another hospital and he provided the best of the best medical team. The ER doctor that I had has been working that ER since the 80s. He's seen everything. He immediately called in the best of the best surgeons and they immediately did a CAT scan and chose to admit me to the hospital. The next day, which was May 13th, I had an emergency colonoscopy, which revealed that I had a tumor uh, in the sigmoid region of the colon, which completely closed off the colon. They couldn't get the scope around to see air couldn't pass. It was completely there. So on May 14th, which is a Saturday, I had emergency surgery. At this time, they removed 10 inches of my colon, the tumor, and 19 lymph nodes. And I woke up with a colostomy. About six days later, we got the results from the pathology that said that it was indeed cancerous um, and that it had metastasized to at least three of the 19 lymph nodes. Therefore, it was stage three, and I would be going through chemotherapy. Um, originally, the doctor had said, no, we can reverse this colostomy within about eight weeks. But when you get a cancer diagnosis, it changes that. Can't. But if, you, if it's possible not to do surgery while you're going through chemotherapy, they don't want you to. Um, this was considered an elective surgery reversal, so it was put on hold until 12 rounds of chemotherapy were completed. Um, and about eight weeks after that, because you have to have time to build back up. Um, chemotherapy for me wasn't as bad as a lot of people have to go through. I didn't lose my hair. It thinned, but I didn't lose it. Um, but I had no energy. And, and I couldn't be around anything cold. If I was getting something out of the refrigerator, I had to wear gloves, even though it was summertime, because it causes severe neuropathy. I had to be careful with air conditioning. Um, on my second chemotherapy treatment, when um, I completed it and was getting ready to leave the oncologist's office, I began to feel like I couldn't breathe. And I thought, I just stood up too fast, and so I walked onto the elevator, 
But when I got to the elevator, I felt like I was gasping for air. I didn't even tell my mom what was wrong. I just spun around and walked back into the oncologist's office and stopped. I didn't even walk to the, to the reception area. I just stopped in the middle of it and said, I can't breathe. And they got a wheelchair and they took me back. Um, at this point, my body was like going into shock. Um, and it was the air conditioning. It, it, I could really breathe, but I didn't feel like I could breathe because the air conditioning made my throat and everything feel paralyzed. So it felt like I wasn't getting any air in. My hands and muscles started drawing up like I was having a stroke um, because of the shock. So of course they did an EKG and showed that that was fine. The oxygen levels were fine and they got me a cup of hot chocolate and things begin to settle down. Now it's bad to have to have that kind of side effect, but if you have to have it, it's really good to have it at the oncologist's office instead of at home, because a paramedic wouldn't have known what to do either. Um, thankfully, that's the only time I had that particular side effect. My husband and my mother were with me when Dr. Smith stood at the foot of the bed and said that it was cancerous. Um, and shortly after he finished, my mom was gonna go home, my husband was gonna stay with me, and my daughter called my mother to see how things were going, and over the telephone, mama gave her the news, and she hung up with mom, and she called my husband, and she was just hysterical. He was on one end of the room, and I was on the other, and I could hear her shouting at him, and you know, I told him, just give me the phone, because She's not going to calm down until she hears my voice, until she knows that I'm okay. So I, to calm her down, the first thing I told her was to listen to me, to be quiet. And I had at that point made my mind up, this was not going to be a death sentence. You know, the first thing you think when you hear cancer is death. Um, but I told her, no, this isn't going to be a death sentence. This is going to be a new lease on life. God's opening a door. I'm going to be able to share with people that I've never been able to share with before because I'm going to have a connection with them because I can say I know what it's like for that doctor to stand at the foot of your bed and say, this isn't what we were hoping for. I reminded her that um, Sometimes we have to descend before we ascend. And Jesus is the best example of that. He died. He was resurrected. But before he ascended to the Father, he descended to the pits of hell. Then he had his ascension. I also reminded her that 2 Timothy 1.7 tells us that God did not give us a spirit of fear. So we know that fear is not just a normal emotion, it's also a spirit. But God gave us power and love and a sound mind. And when you receive that hard diagnosis such as cancer, fear tries to attach to you. And its job, as Jesus says in John 10.10, 10, is to steal and kill and destroy. That's what fear is there for. But Jesus came that we may have life, and life more abundantly, even when it don't feel like it's abundant. So once my daughter calmed down and we were off the phone and my husband was asleep, I sat in that bed and I looked in the mirror and I said, who is this woman staring back at me? Because I'm not the same person I was six days ago. This has completely changed me. I don't, I don't know me now. Um, but I remember your testimony. I, I watched Believer's Voice of Victory Network all the time, and I heard Ken Copeland share his daughter's testimony, and he said, you know, his granddaughter was deathly ill, and the doctors approached her parents and said, she may not make it through the night. And the first thing his daughter did was look at her husband and said, no fear. We're not allowed fear in this room. His granddaughter did survive, and she's doing very well today. But that was not he, and so 
I told my mother and everybody that's coming around me, check your fear of the door. You cannot see me. I know you're afraid of me. I understand that. But check your fear of the door because fear will kill me. And I know that. So as I remember that testimony of Kenneth Copeland, I whispered, no fear, but my mind was shouting it. And God brought my remembrance, 1 Peter 1.13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit and fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So that first action was to declare no fear. But what could I do to prepare my mind for action? Because so much of a cancer diagnosis is a mental battle. That you are, number one, wondering who you are. Wondering, you know, my first thing was, my, ch my girls aren't married. I don't have grandchildren. I'm 45 years old. I don't have time to die. I have too much life coming towards me. But I didn't know how to prepare my mind for, for that action. So I did tell God he had a sense of humor. And I didn't find it very funny. Uh, I, I talk to God like I talk to other people. And when I'm upset, I tell him I'm upset. But I wouldn't ask him why. Because I know why it's going to hold me in a victim mentality. And I'm not going to be that victim. So instead I asked him, what is this all about? What am I supposed to do? And he answered me with Paul's words out of Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Whatever circumstances. I know how to get along with humble means, and I know how to live in prosperity in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He gave me Paul's words. So I replied, well, what's the secret? What's the secret? How did Paul do it? I asked him to reveal it to me. To show me his glory and to show me how to be absolutely content with the cancer diagnosis, with the colostomy. And I'm going to be honest, the colostomy upset me much more than the cancer. It, it just did it. It bothered me. It raised my anxiety. I had to deal with insurance companies. And I would finally reach my breaking point with the one, one lady from the insurance company said, well, what is it that you want? And I said, I want you to experience what I'm experiencing. <laughs> then you'll stop denying my medication. Then you'll stop detaining my supplies. I have a colostomy. You have to get these things to me in a timely fashion. You don't have time to have delays. Experience what I'm experiencing, and then you'll understand. And for some reason, the delay went away, and she sent my supplies. And it, it's, so that bothered me more than the cancer diagnosis. When I asked him what the secret was, you know, looking back at, at Peter, he says, prepare your, your minds for action. God prepares our minds for that action. And often he does it months before we find ourselves in these circumstances. And we don't even realize it. We don't know what we're being prepared for. We took my memory back to August of 2015. I've been teaching at Double Branches and I was studying for um, what we were going to teach that night. And I listened to Graham Cook. And Graham's a wonderful teacher. And he talks about the circumstances, the curveballs that life throws to knock us down and to injure us. And he said, How do we react to those? Typically, if, if the car breaks down and it never breaks down at a good time, um, or you get that hard diagnosis, the first thing you do is you pick up the phone in a panic. And you call your friend, and you call your family, or you call your prayer partner, and you say, please pray for me because I don't know how I'm going to get through this. But what if we looked at it with excitement? 
What if we said thank you? What if when we called that friend, we said, guess what showed up today? Yep. It's that problem I told you was coming, and I knew it was going to be a doozy. The Holy Spirit's going to bounce and knock the balls all morning. I think I'm going to keep it around for a while. And we entered in the Thanksgiving. Paul's secret is being thankful for every circumstance. The good, the bad, the ugly, and all the other times. It's in that Thanksgiving that we can sit comfortably in the presence of our Lord, that he can apply the anointing oil, the healing balm. He can work in us. This journey through the valley of the shadow of death, for me, was for him to teach me how to receive from him and from others. I've always been a giver. I can give, and I can give. But you can give away your very life force. It's possible. Our lives are like bank accounts. We have to make deposits or we can't continue to withdraw or we become overdrawn. And that's the point I was at. So God wanted to teach me to heal, to teach me to rest, to teach me that even though I know he's my source, I needed to know, experience him as my source. David tells us um, in Psalm 23, When I thought of Psalm 23 originally, y'all thought of death because every time I heard it talked on, it was at a funeral. It's the only passage of scripture that the pastors would use at a funeral. So I associated it with death, that God took this opportunity to show me the life in Psalm 23 because David said, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He didn't stop, he didn't visit, he didn't linger, he kept walking. He said, I fear no evil, for you are with me. God walked in that valley with him every step of the way. David said, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So we know that the entire Godhead was there. Because God walked with him. The rod and the staff represent Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And they were there to bring comfort. And then David says, my cup runs over. He's come out of that valley in the shadow of death. And he's experiencing pure joy, pure joy. And he has a revelation. Surely, or truly, goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. Job chapter 22, verse 28. We see that it says, Decree a thing, and it shall be established for you, and light will shine on your ways. So right before I got sick, I had ordered this book, which is titled The Creed of Thing and It Shall Be Established by Patricia King. And I didn't know how much I would need it when I ordered it. But I came home from the hospital and I started reading these decrees. And in there she has decrees on rejuvenation and on health. And it's declaring scripture over our lives. It is giving God's word and assignment. Because in Isaiah 55, 11, God tells us my word will not return to me void without first accomplishing what it was sent out to do. That's a promise to us. <coughs> We've always looked at it as him having to be the one speaking. But our words hold power. Proverbs tells us that the power of death and life are in our tongue. So I used this book. I daily made these declarations over my life. I took my last chemotherapy treatment the Monday before Thanksgiving, and I received the results of my first scan, December 21st, which is right before Christmas and my birthday. And the results came back cancer-free. My latest scan was on July 3rd, and it too is cancer-free. I don't take credit for the results, but I praise God for them. 
I do believe he had me be interactive in my healings. And by saying that, what I mean is my willingness to receive from him for him teaching me to give his word and assignment over my life. For him teaching me to be thankful in all circumstances and hearing his word. Because we're told that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of the Lord. So when I wasn't able to speak it, I had my Holy Bible out and it read, and it would read to me day and night. And I close speaking life into each of you, into your families. From Isaiah chapter 35, verse 10, he says, And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy. And sorrow and sighing shall flee away. You are the ransom of the Lord. Ruthie, Tasha, Ms. Wabon, Joe, they're the ransom of the Lord. And everlasting joy is going to be upon your head. You shall obtain gladness and joy. And sorrow and sighing shall flee from you. Joe Pat Rogers, Regina Stan Sanders, Wavon Rogers, I should have said those are in honor of, in honor of Teresa White.
in memory of Ernestine Matthews in honor of Megan McCartney in honor of Agnes Kirkland in honor of Avis Tuttle in honor of Debbie Kirkland Jace Black in memory of Elise Miller in honor of Christine Lake in memory of Hilda Sheely. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, please um, come out and join us Friday night, 6 o'clock to 11, is that correct? Um, at the Saluda County, um, what do they call it? The, com com the sports complex. Um, now, if you'll just join me in a closing prayer. Dear kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your generosities and your mercies. Please be with each person and family represented here tonight. May the words spoken here tonight be in honor and glory of your name and provide comfort and healing as only you can, Lord. You are the great physician and the Almighty. The power you hold in your hand far surpasses anything held on earth. Be with us as we go out into the world and keep us safe. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Amen.